We're so happy tonight to have my good friend, Pastor Joel Urshan tonight. And as I said, I love the Urshan family. They're like family to me. And I love them dearly. I love his dad, his brother, his whole family. Y'all are dismissed up here, the praise singers and musicians. You're dismissed up here. I want Brother Urshan to come tonight and preach to us, take his liberty, deliver the Word of God tonight. Would you get behind him as he preaches tonight? Brother Urshan, come bless us. We love you in Jesus' name. Thank you so much, my friend. Bless you. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's give the Lord a great big hand of praise. Hallelujah. We have made his praise abundant in this house. Let's continue to lift him up. Let's continue to lift him up. Lord, we worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight at Revival Center in Peru, Indiana, and to be with Pastor and Sister Reed and this wonderful congregation. It's great to see so many people in the house of God. Beautiful, beautiful. Amen. And, of course, so many people whom I love very, very much, who I've known many years since I was, since I was just a boy. And, uh, and these people mean the absolute world to me. And they helped raise me. And uh, I am who I am because of so many wonderful people that are here tonight. And uh, so I love them so very much. And love your pastor and Sister Reed and their family. And I thank God for what is happening at Revival Center in Peru, Indiana. My goodness. Hallelujah. Keep on expanding. Keep on growing. Keep on building. Set your affections on things above. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And it's a great privilege to be here tonight to be able to minister the word of the Lord to you. I want to turn your attention to the book of Hosea, the book of Hosea and the 8th chapter. And uh, I thank God for Pastor Reed's uh, passion for revival, his passion to see the work of God accomplished. And uh, I'm excited about this uh, baptism of our good friends in Jesus' name. This is a wonderful testimony. Amen. From the book of Hosea and the 8th chapter, I want to read a few verses of Scripture tonight. Hosea chapter 8 and verse 2. Israel shall cry unto me, My God, we know thee. I want you to notice verse 3 carefully. Israel hath cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. They have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and their gold have they made them idols, that they may be cut off. Verse number 7. For they have sown the wind, they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stalk, the bud shall yield no meal. If so be it yield, the strangers shall swallow it up. Israel was in a place of having abandoned God, turned their back on God, and the Lord was describing the result of such a decision. But I want to take special note of the third verse. Israel has cast off the thing that is good. And I want to preach to you for a little bit tonight on this subject, the good thing. The good thing. Hallelujah. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Shall we, Heavenly Father, we come to you asking for your divine move in this house. We pray that your word would have free course. Help us to hear your word. Help us to receive your word. Help your word, Lord, to find good ground in us. I pray for an anointing upon your messenger and upon your people tonight. Lord, that the power of the Holy Ghost would flow through this house Accomplish that whereto your word is sent, I pray. In Jesus' name, we thank you for this, and we give you all praise and honor. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen Amen. and amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. I want to point out from the outset of 
this message uh, that uh, I'm going to be speaking quite a bit pertaining to the concept of and to the biblical uh, commission of a thing called marriage. This thing called marriage was an institution and is an institution that was created by the Lord. Before God created any human relationship, He created the human relationship of marriage. And He defined it. And He defined it as the union of one man and one woman. that was shared between Israel and the Lord. The wholeness, the oneness, the union, the relationship that Israel had with the Lord has been cast off, pointing to the idolatrous acts of Israel. And of course... To worship other idols. And so the Bible describes it as Israel having cast off the good thing. Now God uses the relationship of marriage to teach us about what the love of God really is. And uh, in fact, this is why the enemy is trying so desperately in these last days to redefine the whole concept altogether. If he can taint the way people see Marriage, if he can taint the way people see intimacy, if he can taint the way people see the holy union of a man and a woman in matrimony as unto the Lord, then, then he can really basically pervert and distort the way that an individual would see the love of God at all. There's a reason why there is no marriage in heaven or giving in marriage. The only marriage that occurs in heaven is the marriage between Christ and his bride. There's no marriage of us, other, our spouse. even as they are known and there will be complete wholeness and there will be completeness in heaven marriage on earth exists so we can learn the love of God marriage on earth exists so we can understand how the Lord loves us and when you spend a lifetime being married to a person you learn how to love and you learn how to be loved you learn how to endure hard times. You learn how to remain committed. You learn the concept of covenant relationship. You learn how to exist and cohabitate and love in the highs and the lows. 
And that's what marriage is all about. God uses the ordination of a thing called marriage to show us exactly how he loves us and how we can love him. It's an emotional intimacy. It's a spiritual connection. It is a holy union. It is sanctioned by God. Everything God created in the days of creation, he said, it is good. It is good. It is good. The reason he was saying it is good is that it was an adequate reflection of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a good reflection. It accurately depicts the gospel of Jesus Christ. But when he came to man by himself, he said, it is not good. That man should be alone. Now this doesn't mean that a person cannot be single. This simply means that man by himself is not the accurate depiction of the love of God. It is when God created for him a woman, brought her unto the man, and called them male and female, and called him Adam, and Adam called her Eve. And God looked upon this and said, it is very good. So this is, it is important then that in this day and age that we uphold the sanctity of marriage. It is important in this day and age that we declare the love of God through our marriage. And your marriage is under attack, protected in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And, and so, you know, the world tries to put a spin on marriage and tries to, tries to downgrade it, undermine it. Act like it doesn't matter, but the scriptures teach us differently. The world not only comes against the concept of marriage by trying to redefine it, but, but even trying to view it in a degrading way. Uh, for instance, I heard about the man and his buddy who were playing golf. And they got onto the green, and they were putting, and as they were getting ready to putt, a funeral procession went by. And one man was about to putt, and he took his hat off, and he held it over his heart as the funeral procession went by. His buddy was amazed. He said to his friend who took his hat off, he said, man, i got to tell you something. He said, that's impressive. He said, I, 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 people don't even stop their car for a funeral procession anymore. And here you are about to putt, and you pause, and you take your hat off and cover your heart. He said, well, it's the least I could do. I was married to her for 45 years. <laughs> But that may be how the world views the longevity of marriage, but that's not how the church views the longevity of marriage. It's not a drudgery. It's not a begrudging thing. It's a lasting, loving covenant that God ordains, favors, and blesses. Hallelujah. And in that, it is such a powerful union, and it is the most powerful of all human relationships. The most powerful. Listen to how powerful this human relationship is between one man and one woman. This union has the innate power to generate a human soul that will live forever. It is the most poignant and powerful of all human relationships. And God said, listen, through the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus, he said, listen, it's a great mystery, this whole concept of marriage. But he said, this mystery, ladies and gentlemen, you got to understand, is about Christ and the church. So he said, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. And he said, and wives, submit yourselves unto the husbands as unto the Lord. And this was a teaching to understand that this is a beautiful, lasting, loving relationship. That's how it's supposed to be. But the enemy comes in like a flood. The Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. We look at this story of Hosea that we read from, the 8th chapter of the book of Hosea, where that the Scripture tells us that Israel hath cast off the good thing. Israel took that good thing, because it is a good thing. We just lost one of our very fine members, one of the finest members of our church. He was 92 years old. He played the violin in our church for 77 years. 
He played the violin for 77 years faithfully. His wife was just as faithful as him. And they were married for 68 years. I had the distinct privilege of preaching his funeral last night. And my grandparents sang at their wedding in 1948. So it's been a long-lasting friendship and relationship between the families. But this wonderful man uh, and his wife of 68 years, she told me something I thought was so beautiful. She said, you know what? He is at home what you see at church. And I thought, that's an amazing testimony. 68 years to be able to say that about somebody. And, and, and so this is the way that it's supposed to be. A beautiful, lasting, loving, covenant relationship. When we look at the prophet Hosea and his ministry, he had a unique ministry. God called him into a prophetic ministry that was that was quite different from any other ministry that any of the other prophets had. Hosea was called of God and specifically commanded to love a woman by the name of Gomer. He said to him, now I want you to love Gomer and I want you to marry Gomer and I'm going to put a love in your heart for this woman. And you're going to love her, but she's not going to love you back. And he said, when this happens, you're going to understand some things about me that I need you to understand. I'm giving you a ministry that's going to give you a first-hand view of what I go through when Israel casts off the good thing. Gomer's going to love others, but she won't love you. You're going to love her, but she won't love you. And you're going to understand through it all exactly what I experience when Israel chases after Molech. When Israel chases after Ashtaroth, when Israel chases after Baal, when Israel goes after other gods and idols who have eyes but cannot see, who have ears but they cannot hear, who have mouths but they can speak no truth, they are unable to heal, they are unable to deliver, they are unable to save, and here I am, the God of all creation. Here I am, the God who is able to save even to the uttermost. Here I am, the God who loves with limitless love, with mercy that endures forever and truth that endures to all generations. And yet I stand by, helpless as Israel goes, as the Bible would call it, a whoring after other gods and other idols. Hosea, I know this is going to be hard. I know that it's going to be heartbreaking. I know it's going to tear you in two, but I need you to suffer these things because I need you to prophesy with my broken heart. I need Israel to hear the sorrow of my soul, and I need somebody to understand the very depth of my pain. I'm preaching to somebody tonight who has experienced suffering in your soul. You have experienced pain down deep on the inside. The Bible says deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. Can I tell you that every time you open your mouth and declare the power of God from a broken heart, a heart that has suffered, a heart that has been hurt, broken, wounded. The depth of your pain resonates with the depth of someone else's pain. And they can hear the sorrow of God. This is a powerful thing, the sorrow of God. Godly sorrow does something that nothing else can do. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. Hallelujah. Nothing else can work repentance. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know what each and every individual is going through tonight, but I can tell you the answer to what you're going through, and it is this. Repent. I don't know what your problem is, but I can give you the solution. Repent. I don't know how deep the pain, I don't know how hard the journey, but I can tell you that the answer to what you need right now is to humble yourself before the mighty God and repent. That's the answer. That's the solution to all things. 
repent, turn from your wicked ways, look to the Lord. Well, I don't have any wicked ways. That's the first wicked way you need to turn from. The pride of your heart and the self-righteousness of your spirit. Turn, hallelujah, your face to God. Humble yourself before him and repent. It takes the voice of a prophet whose heart has been broken. It takes the voice of a prophet of God who can understand the deep sorrow of God. Hallelujah, this is why God allows ministries to go through difficult times because he's letting that ministry understand his own suffering he's allowing that ministry to understand his own broken heart so when that ministry opens their mouth they speak from the broken heart of God and everybody who hears their message can hear the sorrow of God and repentance begins to work on the inside of them it begins to do something that nothing else can do a sad song can't do it a time perfectly time dramatic point can't do it it doesn't matter what kind of an emotional advantage you try to con concoct it can't do it the only thing that works real repentance is godly sorrow let me tell you something somebody who's never gone through the brokenness of a heart they'll never be able to have a very strong ministry this is how God anoints people Hallelujah, that ram's horn that pastor was holding a moment ago, that, that there was a horn of oil. They would use that horn to pour oil out upon the prophets and the priests and the kings who were anointed of God. Hallelujah, and that, that oil would drip over them. That ram's horn was more than just a trumpet. It was attached to a ram's head, the same ram that was caught in the thicket by those very ram's horns who ended up taking Isaac's place upon the altar they signify mercy this is why when people needed mercy they would run and grab a hold of the horns of the altar it was a ram's horn they were grabbing a hold of it signified the mercy of the Lord can I tell you that your greatest and deepest anointing will come upon you from the very thing that broke your heart Hosea prophesied with an unction of God's jealousy he knew what God felt, and he, when he opened his mouth, he wasn't just reciting words. He wasn't just speaking good things. He opened up his mouth, and out of his own personal life experience, he could relate with God's feelings, and it touched the hearts of those who heard the word. Dr. Gary Chapman wrote an excellent book. The book that he wrote was called The Five Love Languages. The Five Love Languages, and in this book, he describes that there are five basic love languages that everybody has and uses, and they, they both receive love in these love languages, and they express love through these love languages. Anybody familiar with the book, The Five Love Languages? Excellent book. And it's possible, in this book, it's, it's conceivable that an individual could be telling another person, hey, I love you. But because they don't speak the same love language, it's not being perceived by the other individual as love. And so they're not hearing, I love you. They're seeing some good effort at something, but they're not perceiving it as love. The five love languages are quality time, words of affirmation, gift giving, physical touch, and acts of service. I'm going to say them again. Quality time, words of affirmation. Gift giving, physical touch, acts of service. Individual who wants a lot of quality time. I don't want you looking at your phone the whole time that you're with me. I, I want that quality time. That means that quality time is their love language. That's how they give it and that's how they receive it. You can begin speaking their love language and you can convince them, hey, I love you. Words of affirmation, telling them how wonderful, how beautiful, how much you appreciate them, how much they mean to you and praise them and, and pour affirmation upon them. This is how some people receive it, how some people express it. Some people give gifts and that's how they express love and how they receive love. And the gift giving, they're not the kind that, they've got the gift like two months before your birthday. They're not running out at one in the morning the night of your birthday and 
and getting a card real quick and, and, and then giving it to you and realizing that they're a week off, but, but, but <laughs> gift giving, they've got it down. They, they look forward to showing love in this way. That's how they give it. That's how they receive it. Physical touch. People who like to, like to shake hands, like to hug, like to put their arm around somebody. There's, there's this connection, a physical touch. Acts of service. This act of service is is a, 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 an effort at showing love. And if there's any way that I can serve you, if there's any way that I can show you my love, I will do it through serving you and acting out service toward you. Now, I, these are the five love languages of human beings. But as I began to look at them, I realized these aren't just arbitrary love languages. But these are God's love languages. And we have them as our love languages because God has them as his love languages. This is how God expresses love. God expresses his love through quality time. If you don't believe me, look what the scripture says. The scripture said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Lo, I am with you unto the ends of the earth. He said, David said, Lord, though I had wings to ascend like a dove into the heavens, you are there. And if I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Everywhere you can't get away from him. This is why he's omnipresent. Because his love language is quality time. And he wants to spend time with you in the presence of God. That's, that's where you receive love from God. And he expresses his love to you. Through giving you quality time. Not only does he do it through quality time, but he does it through words of affirmation. Words of affirmation. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. One of the reasons why you feel so down is because you're not spending enough time hearing God speak to you about who you are. You have heard people say certain things about you and you've begun to believe it. You've let the accuser of the brethren speak in your ear and you've begun to believe what he's saying. But you need to get into the presence of the Lord and say, all right, God, I've heard what the bully said. I've heard what the enemy said. I heard what the accuser said. Those thoughts have become my own thoughts. I'm living under the oppression of labels that others have imposed upon me. But Lord, Lord, I need to know from my creator, who do you say I am? Oh, he's going to show you his love for you through words of affirmation. He's going to say, you're my child, and you're lovely, and you're wonderful, and I love you. You're worth dying for. Words of affirmation. Get into the presence of God. And listen, it doesn't matter what anybody else says about you. Do you know why it doesn't matter what anybody else says about you? Because they don't know you. You should never let critics get to your heart or flatterers get to your head. Because they don't know who you are. Somebody walks up to you and says you're nothing but a low down good for nothing loser. Don't believe that. They don't know you. Somebody walks up to you and says, you're the best thing since sliced bread. Nobody better. Don't believe that either. Because they don't know you. But what God thinks about you, it really does matter. Because his opinions are not opinions. His thoughts are truth. So when God looks upon us and says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That really matters because he knows everything we've done wrong. He knows everything we've said wrong. He knows everything we've done that is unpure. He knows everything about us inside and out. And he still looks upon us and says, you are my love. You are my fair one. Hallelujah. And I love you with an everlasting love. As far as the east is from the west, so will I remove your transgressions far from you. Not only does he love you with quality time, not only does he love you with words of affirmation, but he loves you with gift giving. Woo. 
For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. The gift of faith, the gift of healing, the gift of discerning spirits, the gift of the working of miracles, the gift of the word of wisdom, the gift of the word of knowledge. Hallelujah. The gift of tongues, the gift of the interpretation of tongues. God shows his love by giving us gifts. Oh, I could go on. Should I go on? Because every good and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Should I go on? He daily loadeth us with benefits. It is the Father's good pleasure to give gifts to the children of men. Hallelujah. Woo. He shows his love for us through quality time. Hey, listen, however long you want to stay in his presence, he'll be there. He'll stay there. He won't look at one phone app. He'll stay there focused on you, tuned into what you're saying, honed in on what you're feeling. Don't give him, don't give him, don't give him some kind of a vain repetition. But speak to him from your heart and he will hear every word you say. God only hears heart language. He doesn't hear vain repetition. He doesn't hear memorized recitation. He hears heart language. And if you'll speak to him out of the pain and praise of your heart, he will hear your cry. And spend quality time with you. Words of affirmation. Gift giving. Physical touch. If you've been in the presence of the Lord very long, you know that God shows love through physical touch. Some people call it goosebumps going up and down their spine. You know, it's, what, it's what's happening when your hand shakes. It's what happens when your head begins to move. It's what happens when you feel dancing in your feet. It's what happens when the joy of the Lord falls fresh on you. Hallelujah. Pardon me a moment while I have a jubilee because the Lord is physically manifesting himself to me. I am, my body is feeling the presence of my God. And not only will your body feel his presence, but his presence will heal your body physically. Hallelujah. He can physically heal your body right now. Why? Because of his love for you. Glory to God. Oh, just because he loves you, that's why he'll heal you. Just because he loves you, he will bring healing to you. Not only does he show love through physical touch, but he shows love through acts of service. God shows love through acts of service, servitude. Now, this is an amazing concept. I want you to consider this with me. The Bible says Jesus took upon himself the form of a servant the form of a servant and I know what we think brother King we think that Jesus was a servant for three and a half years and while he was a servant for these three and a half years he was a servant to everybody he was a servant to the blind he was a servant to the lame he was a servant to the leper he was a servant to those in prison he was a servant to the publican he was a servant to the woman at the well the woman with the issue of blood on and on and on he was a servant to whomever needed a touch from God he was a servant to his disciples when he washed their feet. He was a servant to us when he carried the cross and he went to Calvary's Hill of Sorrow and he died the awful death of crucifixion. And he was a servant when he was buried, thank God. And when he rose from the dead and ascended on high. This is what we do and, and really we do it in error. We, we say he no longer has to be a servant. Because now he's ascended to the majesty on high. Listen, he's still a servant. You thought, well, I, I thought he was in majesty. That's what you got to understand. Servanthood is the majesty. 
See, let him that is minister, let him be. Let him that is chief of all, let him be minister. Him that is great among you, let him be servant. In God's eyes, servanthood is greatness. In God's eyes, ministry and servanthood is the chief of all things. This is what God views as majesty, servanthood. He is still servant. And you say, I thought he was the king. That's his throne, servanthood. If you don't believe that Jesus is still a servant, call on him. Go ahead, call on him. Jesus, I need you, and he'll run to you. Jesus, I need you, he'll run to you. Jesus, I need you, he'll run to you. Because he's still servant of all. I don't, and listen, and it doesn't matter how low you are or how others look down upon you. All you've got to do is call his name and he will emerge as the great power and source of your joy. Hallelujah. These are the love languages of God. Quality time. Words of affirmation. The giving of gifts. Physical touch. Acts of service. And he, he lets us experience this love in the context of marriage. Hallelujah. And, and he uses other human relationships as well to show his love. A father and son relationship. Like as a father pitieth his children. So the Lord pitieth them that fear him. In a mother's love towards her children. He said as a hen gathers her chicks. So I have longed to gather you O Jerusalem. But you would not. As a friend relationship. He said he's a friend. That sticketh closer than a brother. There you see the sibling relationship. Even the grandparent, the grandchild relationship because the promise is unto you and to your children's children. And it is a continual expression of love in every relationship of life. This is why if you're a husband, be anointed in being a husband. And if you're a father, be anointed as being a father. And if you're a wife, be anointed as being a wife. And if you're a mother, be anointed as being a mother and as a grandmother and as a grand father and as a friend and as a brother and as a sister because in each of those relationships you are showing the love of God in the way that you honor your parents in the way that you love your children you are showing the love of God and let me tell you something the, the, the calamity of our world today and the societal problems that exist on every level do so because so many have failed in their responsibility to their relationship. God help me. God help us. Don't you know that when people look upon you as father, that they're looking upon you as an example of God? Don't you know that when people look upon you as a brother, they look upon you as an example of the love of God? This is why he said, this is how all men shall know that you are my disciples, that you have love, love one for another. It's the good thing. It's the good thing. Hallelujah. It's the good thing. Relationship, quality time, words of affirmation. Don't cast off the good thing. You know what you ought to do as soon as you get home tonight you ought to go into your prayer closet and say God I need a refreshing of the good thing I, I need a refreshing of the good thing I need to be in your presence again I need to hear your voice concerning me I need you to speak over me I need to open this Bible and see the words of the Lord for my spirit hallelujah I need to see the quality time with God you know this is how you can show your love to God. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. You can show the love of God through these very love languages. Quality time. Glory to God. Glory to God. Something happens when I spend time in the presence of the Lord. Something happens when I, when I put away the clock and I just spend time in the presence of the Lord. And three minutes might pass, but I have spent quality time in the presence of God. 30 minutes might pass, but I have spent quality time in the presence of the Lord. It's the good thing. 
It's what matters to God. It's, it's the thing that, that builds us, that refreshes us, that cleanses us. Israel cast it off, but God wants it so desperately. But good brother talked about it a moment ago. God looking to restore relationship with humanity. And you look at what the Bible says, Jesus at Martha and Mary's house. And Martha was careful and busy, troubled about many things, the Bible says. But Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. Now, I'm not trying to downplay the importance of a Martha, because thank God for the Marthas. We would all starve if it wasn't for the Marthas. So thank God for Martha and her ministry. But Jesus said to Martha when Martha said, hey, Lord. What's the big idea with Mary not helping out in the kitchen? Jesus said, Martha, you're doing a good job. Keep it up. Don't stop. But Mary has chosen the good thing. The good thing that can't be taken away. That, that, that being in my presence, soaking it in, soaking me in, hearing every word, hanging on to every word that I speak. She has chosen the good thing. David. The man after God's own heart, the psalmist, the prophet, the king. This man who was a lion slayer, a bear slayer, a giant slayer. He said, one thing have I desired of the Lord. And I wonder what the one thing is. Because, it, I mean, this guy knows what he's talking about. He said, there's only one thing I have desired of the Lord. Well, what is it, David? Surely it's to have victory over every giant that comes down the pike. No, no, that's not it. But there's just one thing. Well, tell me what it is, David. I mean, certainly it's got to be that somebody would write a new song about you slaying your 10,000s. That was a big hit. And, and, and certainly you want to have another big hit written in your honor. No, no, no. I don't want people's praises. And I don't even want victory over everything that comes down the pike. One thing have I desired of the Lord. And that one thing will I seek after. To behold the beauty of the Lord. And to inquire in his temple all the days of my life. It's all I want. What if you never slew another lion? What if you never had victory over another bear? But all you had was beholding the beauty of the Lord, inquiring in his temple all the days, every single day of your life. Hallelujah. What if he didn't heal your body? And all you had was inquiring in his temple all the days of your life. What if he didn't get you out of the mess that you're in right now? But all you had was inquiring in his temple all the days of your life. Listen, that's the good thing. Being in his presence. I remember the story that Brother J.T. Pugh and Sister Bessie Pugh was shared concerning them. Some of you remember the ministry of Brother J.T. Pugh, one of the great preachers of the gospel. He personally impacted my life in such a deep way. I will never forget his ministry. He had a good thing with Sister Pugh. Many years of marriage they shared together. And, and late in life, Sister Pugh developed a severe disease of Parkinson's. This Parkinson's disease began to overtake her body, caused her to contort and, and her body to become uncontrollable. Brother J.T. Pugh was a great preacher of the gospel. He preached around the world for many years. And, and when she developed the disease, he decided to preach out just once a month. And he took care of her just every day, took care of her every day, except one day a week because he too was getting aged. And he decided that he would, he would take one day a week to refresh his body and be prepared for the next several days of caring for Sister Pew. And, and he did everything for her, taking care of her body and making sure she had what she needed. Unexpectedly, Brother Pew passed away. Before he passed away, he lost his hearing. And he could no longer hear Sister Pew when she would wake up in the night and, and need assistance. It was a dangerous thing because she would be in need of assistance. He couldn't hear her and she couldn't communicate with him. So he decided to tie a, 
little string around his wrist and the other end of the string around her wrist so that when she would wake up and her body would begin to contort, he would, he would feel because it would pull his arm down and he would get up and he would tend to her and take care of her and help her in her sickened state. It was love. It was the good thing. It was the wholesale, I'm here for you. It was God and his people. It was Christ and the church. And, and then unexpectedly, Brother Pew passed away. It was a surprise because she had been sick for such a, a while. And, and yet, Brother Pew passed away. And, and so it was devastating to the family. It was devastating to Sister Pew. The children came to her and comforted her and said, Mother, everything's going to be all right. We're going to take care of you. I know Dad has passed on to be with the Lord. He's in a better place now. And we will take care of you. She said, you don't understand. She said, JT and I had a good thing going. And within 24 hours, she passed away. And a double funeral was held in their honor. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. As the apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose, by the hinds of the field, that you stir not up, nor awake my love till he please. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up! Rise up! Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. I believe if you could hear the word of the Spirit tonight... It would simply be, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Come away with me to a secret place. I have a place prepared for you that where I am, there you may be also. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadows of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my shelter, my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. The good thing. It's the good thing. It's the good thing. I, I don't know what kind of talent you have, but you don't even have to have talent to have the good thing. I don't know how much money you've got, but you don't have to have any money to have the good thing. The lame man said to Peter and John, I, I want an alms. He expected to receive an alms. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but I do have something. It's the good thing. I'm in covenant relationship with God. And in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Somebody lift up your hands right now. And show God some love the way he receives love and the way he expresses love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what you ought to do right now? You ought to give God love. Give God love in this way. This is a good way right now to give God love. Words of affirmation. Open up your mouth and begin to affirm Him right now with words of praise. With words of praise. Tell Him, You are holy, Lord. You are mighty God. Excellent is Your name in all the earth. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. You are wonderful, Lord. You are holy, God. You are wonderful, God. You are mighty in all your ways. Come on, that's it. Enter into that secret place. Hallelujah. Enter into that good thing. Enter into that good thing where it's just you and God. It's just you and God. It's just you and God. Hallelujah. 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 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus. Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth Proclaim Kings and kingdoms They shall all pass away But there's something about that name Jesus Jesus, Jesus, there's just something about that name. Master, oh, Savior, his name is Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, oh Jesus, Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim. They shall all pass away, but there's something about that name. Right now, there are people facing difficulties in this house. There are people facing difficulties right now. You're experiencing sorrow in your life. You're not experiencing that by accident. God is going to allow you through this experience to know His suffering and to know His sorrow. And a ministry of His kingdom will be born in your life as a result. The answer that you need right now, you want to know what is the next step? What do I do? Where do I go? How do I handle this? The very next step you need to take is submit yourself to His presence and humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. This is the good thing. And it is the answer to every question and the solution to every problem. Enter his presence right now. Hallelujah. Come on, enter his presence right now. Hallelujah. Come on, all across this house, enter into the presence of God, the banqueting house, and let his banner over you be loved. Come on, that's it right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Oh, glorious Jesus.
Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kingdoms, they shall all pass away, but there's something, hallelujah, about that name, hallelujah, that's it, that's it, that's that good thing, that's that good thing, hallelujah, oh Jesus, his name is Jesus, yes, that's it, that's it, Jesus, Hallelujah. Proclaim, King, Master, Savior, Jesus. He called Bahashataya. Come on, that's it. That's it. Pour your heart out to him right now. Pour your heart out to him right now. Pour your heart out to him right now. Hila Bahashahai. Hila Bala Bahasandala Mahai. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Have your way, mighty God. Have your way, mighty God. Hila Bahashanala Mahasi. Yes, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. That's it. That's it. That's it.